Good evening and welcome to The Square. Tonight's discussion is going to focus on what they do not tell you about entrepreneurship. Usually when we have this sort of talk, um, the focus is how to avoid the pitfalls. It's usually about success stories. But today we're going to talk about the challenges, how to get out of them, listening to the personal journeys of our guests that are here tonight. My name is Dan Mpisi. I'm the host of the show, uh, of The Square. And I'd like to, very happy to introduce um, all these young, under 30, amazing entrepreneurs with us tonight. And I will start with um, you, Andrew, the only man on the panel tonight. Uh, Andrew <laughs> Mugabe is the co-founder of Gasabo Model Farm. I'm sure many of you have seen um, the amazing Twitter, social media account on Twitter. Great to have you, Andrew. Thank you, thank you. Uh, um, we're also joined by uh, Christ uh, Kevin Kajirimhundu, and uh, Kevin is the co-founder and CEO of Uzuri KNY Designs. Very, very happy to have you here. Thank you, Dana. Uh, on my Left, we are joined by Christelle Quizera, and uh, Christelle is the founder and MD of Water Access Rwanda. Great to have you on the square. My pleasure to be here. And as always, Brenda Namata, resident panelist of the show. Um, our other panelists couldn't be with us this evening, but yeah, we are here to hold the fort down with our guests for tonight. And before we kick off um, to our guests, we usually have a sort of icebreaker, uh, midweek highlights, and um, I know, Brenna, you, there's some you'd like to share. Uh, I'll start yeah. with you. Um, there's so much bad news. So I'll just so much, so much. Yes. I'll just focus on the good news. Yes. Uh, this week we saw the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure, uh, together with the uh, Transporters Association, roll out uh, public buses with facilities for people with disability. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think really that's a significant step, uh, for especially for public transport. So I'm excited, and uh, I hope that that will that will be available like countrywide and we'll begin to see uh, more places putting in place facilities for people with disability. I, I agree. Very, very kudos to the ministry. And you, Christelle, is there something you'd like to share with the panel? Yeah, um, sorry, I'm the one who's going <laughs> to bring the bad news to the table, but definitely what's happening in South Africa, there's xenophobia. It's, you know, every year it seems it happens, it happens. Um, and it's kind of deep on my mind as an African, but also thinking of the violence that's happening between Africans to Africans. I really hope it ends soon and there is like a permanent, uh, you know, brotherhood that can really be there in all our countries. And yeah, but that's kind yeah. of been the highlight for me. Uh, my highlight for the week is again on South Africa, but this in particular is the femicide that's been going on. I mean, in just one week, three women shot, killed, raped. Um, there's always been violence against women in, in South Africa, but I don't know if it's because it's social media and we're seeing things in real time, but um, it seems like there's an upsurge and it's just heartbreaking um, uh, as a woman, but just seeing this happening on a large scale. And again, I hope this is something, you know, uh, to our, our sisters in South Africa that um, a sort of permanent yeah. or semi-permanent solution is, is found to address this violent endemic um, femicide in South Africa. Do you have anything you'd like to share or should we go straight to Andrew? Andrew? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have much to share, but I'll just say, obviously, men are trash. <laughs> if we have to go into the semantics of explaining all that, when people are being killed, women are being killed by men, it's just heartbreaking. It is. Yeah, yeah. Interesting for you to say that as well as a man. But um, yeah. you, you get what it means anyway. I know. Yeah. I, I think maybe we should do a show on that mm -hmm. one day and, mm -hmm. you know. So before we kick off, um, yeah. I would like to thank you once again. Uh, we have these young entrepreneurs doing great things who've been in business for you know, over five years at least. Uh, some have started new. And we're here really to talk about your personal journeys and we hope this will inspire upcoming entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs who are watching the show um, and so forth and so on, including also policymakers that you know, uh, regulate the business environment uh, or social enterprise environment in this country. Uh, and Andrew, I'll start with you. Uh, regarding Gasabo Model Farm, and um, you know, agribusiness is a very risky ad um, adventure. You cannot control the weather, the crop yields. The, you know, there's so much uh, related risk to agribusiness, but you're doing it differently because you're using greenhouse technology. So, if you could just share with us this greenhouse technology that you're applying to Gasabo Model Farm, uh, how does this work, and how what inspired you to uh, take this path? Um. Greenhouse technology itself, it's a way of controlling the weather, but not actually controlling it. Like Overall, you're just controlling the weather for your plants. Mm -hmm. So you just build up a structure and install uh, 
a watering system, probably ventilation. Basically everything in there, the plant doesn't get in contact with the outside envir environment. And that way it doesn't get affected by weather changes or pests and diseases. So it's just there. You plant the seeds and the only thing that comes out is the, the harvest. Yeah. So if you find something that works, it's important to let it work, do its job. So we didn't discover greenhouse technology. It's been around for a very long time, for hundreds of years. But it's kind of a new technology in Rwanda. So when we found out that we could still do agriculture, because it's kind of belittled by the youth, if you like. Nah. It's not sexy not enough. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's not sexy enough. But yes. while we were at university, there was this campaign, A Greek is Cool. And Which there was university? a university. Uh, university are. of who? University of Rwanda. University of Rwanda. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Back then it was called national, but that doesn't matter. Mm. Thing is, that campaign, a Greek is cool, was encouraging um, the students to write articles or innovations about agriculture that would encourage others to come into the agriculture sector. So. We tried to write something with a friend of mine, and yeah, it was that bad. Mm -hmm. So we didn't win the greenhouse kit that we wanted. So we shelved it. But after graduating, uh, we applied for, there is this entrepreneurship program. It's called uh, the Tony Alumelu Foundation. Yes, foundation. Yes, yeah, the yes. TIP program. So we got some funding, and I would say that is what kick-started our journey. The journey and your journey is uh, is it yourself do you have a partner is it is this the partner the one you're with from you know university of rwanda back in the day when you wrote the agric is cool proposal mm, no um i think with partners mm. sometimes you get a loose down there mm -hmm. i'm not for the bad or anything but sometimes when you when you're not moving at the same pace sometimes ideas have to change and you're like yeah this is not gonna work mm -hmm. so it is another person Another partner of mine, uh, I met him in 2017 at K-Lab. We were working on, this, on different projects, but under the same program, the Tony Alumelu program. He had a different idea, I had a different idea. At that time, I had a loser idea. It's mm. not exactly <laughs> loser, but it's not feasible. Yes. Uh, I think you've heard of hydroponics. Nope. No, please share. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you grow plants without soil. Like, yeah. You uh -huh. just grow them in like small cups and feed them. Uh, nutrients that are in liquid form. That is the idea I had and it was funded by the Tony Lumelo Foundation but I had to shelve it because it wasn't kind of feasible for the current, the state of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, with my partner, we thought of why don't we start Gasau El, Gasau Mother Farm and do this exactly. So we joined hands and came up with working on the greenhouse idea that we had in college with another partner who is no longer interested in agriculture. Mm -hmm. That is how we started Cassava Model Farm. And where is it today? If you can give us a brief sort of sh um, you know, screenshot on where the status of Cassava Model Farm today. Okay. I know before the show when we started, you, you said some really impressive stuff about how, based on social media, some of your greenhouses, you know, you managed to sell them. And oh yeah, uh, the thing with agriculture, like primary production, because that is what we do, uh, you plant the things and then you wait for them to grow, and then you sell them, and then you grow again. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been running for like, um, I don't know, one season. Mm -hmm. So we planted our first, uh, our first produce in, at the end of 2018. That was in around November, and we started, no, December, and we started harvesting in February. Um, that is when we started our social media campaign, Eat yeah. Your Veggies. Yes, and then somebody just media. called us. I would like to buy everything you have in your greenhouses. <laughs> a couple of tweets later. That was and nice. Yeah. And did they actually buy? They did. Wow. They did. Yeah. So that's the part of social nice. media as well, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we, we are finished with one season, then we started another season. And I don't know how to tell you. We just started, but now well, things are looking good yeah. and promising. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, especially since you're one of, you know, Rwanda's young people involved mm. in agribusiness. And like I said, it's quite risky. Yeah. So, Brenda, is there something you'd like to, sh to add before I... I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> amazed. I'm blown away. Yeah, I'm, I'm blown away, especially, you know, we have a panel of very young people.
Uh, you and I were talking about this, you yeah. know, having young people on the panel. And it's very interesting when you see a young person uh, in the agriculture sector, because as we know, for a very long time, th there's so much that's been happening in terms of the agriculture sector, trying to attract uh, young people to do uh, agriculture. And I must say the mindset is changing, and he's a clear example of that. Um, I think we just need to see you see your probably your fifth or tenth birthday, and then perhaps <laughs> all the youth, oh, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you could give us a sense of um, some of, uh, as you are starting, because mm -hmm. you, you know you talk about your partner, identifying the partner. Mm -hmm. What are those things that you know you had to do to actually get the work started? Uh, the starting is usually not the hardest, but the few months after starting. So uh, I met this guy, my partner, he's just heaven sent. <laughs> and I didn't know him before, but mm. he had the passion and I had the passion. So when we joined the forces, uh, there was a, another competition for the, I think it's BDF, uh, it's called Kodawijire, something mm. like that. Yes, so yes. where people submit business plans into uh, uh, the district and then they will select two and then submit them to BDF and then they will be reviewed and then you get the funding. So we didn't have enough funding uh, to run the business the way we wanted because greenhouse technology is kind of uh, expensive, I would say. Like you have to invest kind of a lot. It is expensive. It is, yeah. Kind of? <laughs> well, I would say it's, uh, it's yes. cost effective. It's cost effective. Yeah. So. Uh, we applied for BDF and we went through a kind of a lengthy process, but we got the money after all. That's when we started. So what we did, we gave everybody, f like f the two of us, we took over like all the responsibilities. What I want to do, you will do. I'm not going to designate a role to you. What I can do, you will do. And maybe we just got lucky and my partner and I, kind of does more than I do <laughs> and he's kind of more passionate than me but it's, I would say I, we just got lucky. If you have a partner who is not that passionate about what is going on, you will kind of just, yeah. it will just kind of and, and, and I'd like us off. to just hold that thought there because we're going to talk about partnerships um, okay, okay. during the rest of the show mm -hmm. uh, because I think business partners, it, it's crucial. It is so crucial that the partner you're doing business with yeah. is someone who, you know, you complement each other. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, Christelle, uh, I like that you corrected me mm -hmm. before the show started. You started the company when you were 20 years old, not 22. Um, wow. And you, you started this... Um, you gave up a secure income, you know, for a social impact enterprise. And um, this is Water Access Rwanda. And um, at your age, at just 25 years old, you know, what led you to pursue this, this social enterprise? And, uh, you know, providing water to Rwanda and her neighbors, you know, in Uganda, in a DRC, it's, it's a big, it's, a, it's not a mean feat. Mm -hmm. So if you could just share with us briefly before we take a deep dive into uh, Kevin and challenges that you face um, that you'd like to share with other entrepreneurs. What inspired you to to um, start Water Water Access Rwanda? So I kind of draw um, from two different experiences I had growing up. Um, on one, I'd always wanted to have a social impact. Mm -hmm. So I I think growing up from my parents, from my family, we were never allowed to complain without offering a solution. So seeing issues that are happening, like for example, when uh, the war in South Sudan started, it's like I remember watching the news and my first comment was one like, okay, let's wait for the war to end and then <laughs> reconstruction <laughs> efforts you know, have to start. So I'd always seen myself as, you know, I can offer a solution. And I'd always been passionate about business, about seeing money multiplied, the concept of like, I have 1,000 today and through some activities I do, tomorrow I can have 10,000 and so on. Uh, not necessarily for the sake of being rich. I have considered as a person to take a vow of poverty, <laughs> but just seeing <laughs> growth happen yes. and through your hands and other people's. So when um, I actually, uh, I went to school for mechanical engineering in the US. University of Oklahoma? 
uh, Oklahoma Christian University. Oh, sorry, yeah. OCU, Oklahoma Christian yeah. University, yes, yes. And uh, every summer, I always came home with a different project. So I was a social activist at that point, mainly concerned with the environment and youth, gender and reproductive health issues. So I never really thought about water and infrastructure, things like that. But I did know that youth employment was a huge concern. Oh, yeah. And as I talked to my friends who were going to universities here, those who didn't make it to university, I realized there was such a big difference in how we were thinking. Uh, but I also saw there was a lot of support in Rwanda to support young people to do uh, to offer solutions. So for example, uh, we run a camp for university students in Rwanda with other students from Oklahoma. And like you could write to the Senate and request a meeting and like next week, the president of the Senate is like, yeah, I'll be in my office mm -hmm. <laughs> and tell me, you know, your little project, that's like $10,000. In the scheme of thing, that was a very small project, but they always had time for us. So the next year, I did another project to provide clean water. So at the time, I used to go on Idihe every time to try to connect with you know what's happening in Rwanda, especially being so far away. And then I kept seeing like, oh, woman eaten by crocodile fetching water. Kid dies from crocodile fetching water. Mm. Or there is a community upheaval because if you kill a crocodile, you probably owe one million. But if it kills a human, the compensation is like 300,000 or 200,000. Yeah. So the environment uh, <laughs> activist, mm -hmm. me, all I was like, oh, protect the environment. I was like, this is not just. <laughs> so yeah. then I was like, okay, let, let's try to do a project. Mm -hmm. And where we were in Oklahoma, there was so much opportunity. So you could go to some, you had people who were like, how can I help? Mm -hmm. How can I help you? You know, what can I do to help Rwanda? You know, you had so much interest. So then with the par partnership of other students and also the then president of my university, we raised uh, over $75,000 for a summer project. We were going to drill boreholes. So people never had to go again back to the lakes to fetch water. So I thought this is going to be a nice summer project. I go back, pursue my dream mm -hmm. of being an aerospace engineer. I always had like very weird, <laughs> different <laughs> dreams than what I'm doing right now. It's not weird. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm not weird very out of space. <laughs> but um, so I come for the summer project. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was supposed to be three months. We trained 10 young people. I saw their lives transformed. The communities were working in. So like I moved to work in Rukumbi, like very rural areas. Like you, you couldn't find even a cemented mm -hmm. house to rent. So like just yeah. to give you an idea. <coughs> so I kind of saw myself and how old I'm were you, like a, How old were you when this was happening? So I was 20. Wow. And I was like, I'm being, you know, an eco warrior, you know, going deep in the village doing yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, like, I never consider myself to be blind to what's happening in Rwanda. I mean, I grew up in Yamirambo. Uh, some of my childhood, I was living in uh, Rutongo, like outside of Kigali, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then I was also a Kigali person, but never really too secluded from like poverty. But I went to that area and like what I saw completely broke my heart. Mm -hmm. Not only you kind of take other things like as given privileges. So for example, they put getting water from the, from the lake. Even after digging a borehole, people would still go. Like some people would still pass the borehole to go to the lake. Mm -hmm. And then you realize, okay, so we just gave you clean water, but we need now to educate you <laughs> so you can access the clean water. And coming from a youth perspective, but seeing these were older people, people I respect, but having to go against their myth or um, give an assumption. It was, so it felt like a huge big work, but one with huge impact. So at the end of the summer, we're doing a video to thank the different donors to the project. Um, and this lady says uh, on, the, on camera, like, every time I used to send my kids to go fetch water, I faced the reality that they would never come back. And I was thinking like, the irony of it is even the water the kid is fetching is not clean. Mm. So it's kind of like they're losing either way. You know, the kid maybe comes back with water, but that water contains bacteria that's going to get yeah. them sick. Mm. And we were in a classroom uh, during one of our trainings, and we asked the kids, like, who here has, been, uh, has missed school last week because they were suffering from diarrhea? And, like, all the kids had their oh, hands up. Dear. And, like, the two kids who didn't, everyone was like, oh, well, even you, you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, you see that it's like, oh, my God, this is crazy. It's a huge crisis. Mm -hmm. And then you realize, okay, we're working in this one sector. This solution is not even enough. This is still happening on a major scale around the world. So 400 millions of Africans are still going through realities like that. So when I saw that, actually out of a whim, as they said, studying is easy. Mm. 
I gathered some of the young people we had trained in the project. We jumped in a car, we went to RDB, I registered a company. And I'm like, I'm gonna keep doing this. And then I went back to school to figure out <laughs> how I was gonna do oh, yeah. this. But already the interest was there. We had, cause we were you know, drilling, we had the tools, we had the technology. So people, even farmers were like, oh, we want to irrigate, can you drill boreholes for us? And so we already had the technical capability to do it. Um, so I went back to school, researched other technologies we can bring into the space, try to make it cheaper. And that's kind of how it started. But so for me, the moment I registered the company, I, you know, I still struggled graduating. Mm -hmm. I had like two days where I was thinking like, okay, I'm gonna move back home in a company that has no capital, no funding, <laughs> no clients. And like, that's what I'm gonna do. Like, cause it kind of feel like I'm giving up on much bigger. You know, there were career opportunities in oil and petroleum, especially, you know, you say you have experience drilling, doing geophysical survey, but like, oh yeah, yeah. Mm. Like, you know, she Come looks to the good as, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so looking at that, but then I knew where my heart was. Mm. I knew what would help me grow. Um, so there is kind of that perspective. Like I've always seen myself as a solution maker. And I'm like, actually there is a lot of interest in Rwanda that this could be a viable business mm. and one that employs many young people. So today we now employ 60 people total mm. and our average age as a company is 29 years old. So I'd say that way we are now, you know, five years later we've achieved quite a lot in terms of employing young okay. people, but also in terms of giving clean water. I mean, we don't even know exactly what our impact is, but it keeps growing. So seeing that that has happened now, I'm like, you know, I smile, but then I'm staring, you know, maybe provide water for 100,000 people. There's still 400 million out there. I know, that's true. So it's like we need to get out there. We need to get everywhere. We need to always be better because the need is so big. Can you just very quickly, before we move to fashion, give us a scale in terms of, uh, you said you don't have the exact number because it keeps on growing, but in terms of families that you've impacted, uh, the number of boreholes that you've drilled? Mm -hmm. So we've now uh, drilled 93 boreholes. Um, in some of the boreholes, we install electrical pumps that feed to many different water sources. Uh, but as per end of 2018, we provided water to 132,000 people. Um, and I know, uh, before we used to drill and leave, right? Like we drill a borehole, we know mm -hmm. the community is using it. But now we've realized that's not very sustainable for the long term. Mm -hmm. So we no longer install hand pumps, like we want to provide piped water. Mm -hmm. So now we are counting people who have access to managed water. So that's 32,000 people every day that obtain water from um, any of our different water systems. And, and which countries are these? Because I know you, you're in the region. Is mm -hmm. it just Rwanda at the moment? We actually usually count Rwanda because mm. when we, so we've done forays into those other countries. Uh, we're looking to expand with the permanent presence in DRC and then Angola. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Uganda, it's been, you know, one on one off projects, usually mm -hmm. for private individuals, mm -hmm. farmers, uh, some people build nice remote houses and then they need mm -hmm. off-grid access to water. Mm -hmm. So there's still that market, mm -hmm. but our heart is really in the social impact, like creating community water points. Mm -hmm. But the business is, does make a lot of money from um, the rich who want their own water systems. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. It is. I am, I, I feel like we're not, we're not doing much <laughs> with our lives by uh, <laughs> listening to these I know. incredibly um, talented uh, young entrepreneurs. So one thing I think we pick up is that you all follow your passion. And um, Kevin, I know you have a partner, Isolde, that you started uh, Uzuri KNY Designs with. And uh, we know the fashion industry has been growing a lot um, in Rwanda over the last couple of years. And, um, but recently, you embarked on a social impact project, and you provided school shoes to children. Um, if you can tell us you know, a bit more about this social impact project, as well as give us a brief background on how you started uh, Uzuri KNY Designs. Thank you so much. Uh, Uzuri KNY started in 2013. We were still at university, and we had an idea Which of creating university? sustainable. Oh, uh, Kiss. That was a former Kiss. I think okay. now it's just just very quickly. I think <laughs> Brenna is zeroing on in the point that we actually have universities that yes. turn out. You um, are. It's always University this, of Rwanda. I yes, think. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so are, are we are doing good, I think, by <laughs> universities that... Uh, yeah, right? She keeps on asking what university... Um, yeah. yeah, and yeah. We, we made a university as we were working on this project and we we're just wondering what are we going to do um, as young people studying creative designs and how can we involve a lot of people doing this? Because we're doing it out of passion, to be honest. 
And we created Uzuri out of passion and also with an idea that it could be a sustainable business instead of just being fashion and just for entertainment. Okay. So we wanted to involve a lot of people in order to be able to sustain the company but also create viable solutions that could actually impact our communities. Um, one of the things that we really aimed to do was to uh, kind of craft solutions to recycle waste to create functional footwear or any other products or materials that could be functional for our communities. Um, and out of just one table, uh, I remember going to the streets and just calling shoemakers like, hey, can you work with us? And of course, so many would, would be like, no, we cannot make shoes from scratch or something. It's, it's, it's not the culture here, we just repair. Only one person followed the, the idea and we started working, selling one pair to door to door, uh, to now having retail stores and selling online and being all over the world. Um, and last year, I think, uh, we, at the end, we were able to actually build our own workshop and, and uh, employ at least 55 people in our workshop and, and more. And we're actually training, uh, so far we have trained over 750 people uh, to learn how to make shoes, to be able to build this whole industry that's almost non-existent. And actually five of them have created their own small or micro businesses, also creating shoes and, and selling them to different people. And that's really something that we're very, very proud of. Mm -hmm. um, so as we uh, we go to the workshop, which is a little bit in the, vi in the village in Gahanga, Gahanga yes. I I mm -hmm. always used to see the kids going to school with no shoes, and one day I just passed by and, and they were like, oh, actually you haven't seen it. The kids don't even go to school because they don't have shoes, uh, and oh. it's kind of in their policy that every kid has to wear shoes, and sometimes parents cannot actually um, afford buying shoes every time, and the kids grow so fast, they cannot mm, buy yes. shoes every time. That's so right. like, okay, let's give just 50 pairs, that's what we can afford. But we were kind of also empowering the people who were working with us in our factory, who were learning, and we're like, okay, you're going to create shoes that are going to be functional. And these shoes are going to be worn by, firstly by students across the streets, which is a school right next to us. And they, they met them, and, and, and when we went to give 50 pairs, we're like, my goodness, there's so many kids who are not wearing shoes or who are not wearing functional shoes. So we decided to do it the following year, and uh, we're looking forward to do more to, to be able to actually uh, be part of our community and, and kind of make them feel like they're part of us as well, mm -hmm. because we're working from their area, even if we're employing a lot of people from that same area, but we also want to make sure that the people, the young ones, see what's happening, and then hopefully they can be inspired. Well, I mean, yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> it's incredible stuff you're doing. And, um, you know, uh, I just wanted you, got, you to give a brief background on, you know, the work that you're doing from, you know, agribusiness, um, footwear in the fashion industry, as well as, you know, access to water, uh, very diverse, but very impactful work that you're doing. But if you can just talk about um, the challenges, uh, the dark days that you've mm -hmm. had in this journey um, called entrepreneurship, especially for people who are being inspired by you, by your work, or who are going through the same thing right now. Like, what were they and how did you overcome them? And uh, I'll start with you just briefly. Andrew? See, um, agriculture is unpredictable. Kind of unpredictable, even when you're working in a controlled environment. Sometimes, something just happens and there is nothing you can do about it. So, uh, we had a client one time and we agreed to give him a full greenhouse of tomatoes. And even though they say numbers don't lie, some numbers really lie. Mm. So um, the person who helped us build the greenhouse is like the technician. Uh, it's, a, it's a greenhouse company around here. I don't think it's important to mention its name. <laughs> they gave us numbers and they told us, this greenhouse will be able to give you this amount these kilos, this number of kilos. When actually, they didn't tell us that this will depend on this. Getting this will depend on this. It could depend on the quality of seeds, the quality of water, the soil itself, its acidity, so many things. So we promised a business person yeah. that would be able to give you this amount of kilos per week. And well, we failed because the numbers lied to us. Mm -hmm. What happens when you lie to, like when you don't deliver, when you mm -hmm. don't deliver what mm -hmm. you want, things tend to go differently. Mm -hmm. So it didn't go well with the client because one of the greenhouses got infected, first of all, even though 
inside a greenhouse, nothing should really get infected. Mm -hmm. So dealing with an infection in a greenhouse, in a greenhouse, wow. sometimes you just have to cut everything and like leave it for like maybe a month and maybe plant something else that won't be infected by maybe the fungal disease or anything else. So the unpredictability it's crazy. of agriculture is just, yes. it could just make you feel like, yeah, why am I even doing this? <laughs> I could be doing something and, else. And how did you overcome it? I mean, how did you get through this? Well, we had to outsource. Mm. Yeah, we had to outsource from other greenhouse farmers and we had to fulfill what we had promised the business person. Mm. And yeah, but we just had to cut whatever we had and just took it out. See, the problem is it just doesn't end there. If you lose one client, one big client, you tend to even get afraid of getting another mm. really big client because something might happen. So, yeah. So even your morale, your confidence? Kind of. Yes. So is, is this something that you're working um, toward? Is this something that you're working on? Um, currently, uh, we solved that, mm -hmm. and it's n we're not having it anymore. Mm -hmm. But your intention, sometimes you just have to maybe uh, put something on the side, like mm -hmm. we're gonna put, we're gonna grow, we're gonna build another greenhouse and it's not gonna target like, its output is not gonna be like a major, like, a, like for a major market, mm -hmm. but it will just come in to, to break the gap that these other greenhouses are doing and that is what we're doing right now. So basically re-strategizing and you know going back on the drawing board. Exactly. So to exactly. speak. Yeah. Another thing. Yes. When we were starting we had a business plan that was like uh, around 65 pages. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the first rule about business plans like keep it short, simple, sweet and practical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. About that. Did you actually yeah. write it? We've so never looked at it. <laughs> what? <laughs> we wrote it so we could get the funding, yes. but mm -hmm. honestly, it's not practical at all. Yes. So when we were requesting the funding, I'm just going to give you an example. Mm -hmm. the, the BDF wanted us to give them the actual numbers. Mm -hmm. So we went to the market. During that time, uh, we grew bell pepper, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, during that time, they were around 500. A kilo. Mm -hmm. I think there was a, a drought. Uh, mm, no, not mm. exactly. I think there was a surplus on the market, and oh, okay. there was a lot of them. Okay. So when we gave, when we wrote the business plan, we wrote that we'll be selling a kilo of colored paper at 500. So that business plan automatically changes mm -hmm. the moment the harvest comes out, and you find out that a kilo of colored paper is at 2,500. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. See, the business plan, you just have to throw it out because, mm -hmm. well, maybe you just had to... Adjust it. Up. Adjust. 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 Yeah, exactly. So adjust. Uh, Sometimes it feels like you just do it to appease whoever is giving yes, you money because... Yes. The Did, strength, don't you feel the like weaknesses? sometimes we have to do it for ourselves just to look at it and keep changing things in them and then following what's going on and predicts few things for our own companies because yeah. I feel like it's our own environment and exactly kind uh, of ha it's our own yeah. climate and we kind of have to predict what's going to happen tomorrow at some point we've been working for a year and I don't know how to answer that question but mm. our business plan hasn't been useful in any way mm. <laughs> well. we try to use it for the starting numbers like mm. how much we're going to need the startup capital and everything mm -hmm. but the projections they don't really mean anything because they don't relate. They are they, they're not exactly what's in reality. Yes. So the business plan let us down, and we spent a lot of time on it. Yeah. yeah. But, but I think mm -hmm. within the first year, and sorry for stealing your time, <laughs> but yeah. within the first year, that's where usually you're looking at your assumptions, mm -hmm. and like your financial model will probably get more complex mm -hmm. the more you grow but it's still pretty important to have written down strategy and vision. Even if I expect, like, when we started, for example, doing this uh, rural water kiosk, mm -hmm. where, like, each one is going to pay for itself in two years' time. In the first month, it's like, we're going to hit that number. Like, yeah. it looks good. Mm -hmm. And that was June. And then July comes, it's still looking good. August hits, rain comes. <laughs> Our numbers, we go from, like, 60% performance to, like, 20% yeah. of installed capacity. So yeah. we're like, okay, you know what? And mm -hmm. you run the numbers on your rain season performance, mm -hmm. 
and like you're never gonna pay back your capital. Oh. <laughs> but I think, I think that helps you to also build your business plan for the following year, yeah. knowing mm -hmm. the seasons, how they change and everything. You, le you, learn, you learn from the experience. Yeah. My problem yes. with the and business plan. And you deal plan. with it. Mm -hmm. like, so business plan, it's a moving document. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, that's it's, it's not, not one really film document. It needs it's to be revised. Yes. The, pr yes. the, the problem with it, it's a dynamic document mm -hmm. with static segments, like you have to account for the inflation. Mm -hmm. You have to account for like price changes. You can't predict that. Yeah. And I have an idea about what you're saying. He's simply saying that you know the formalities don't work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. They have to work on the job. Yeah, has to work for you. I'd like to, to hear from you, um, yeah. Krista, on your exactly very interesting, um, you know, sharing that you've had. Uh, if you can share with us, you know, some key things challenges. that yes, challenges. <laughs> Oh, I think I have a long list of yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take one in, in the interest of time, unfortunately. Yeah, I'll yeah. just, for the interest of time, I'll say one that's been big and still is here now is trying to forge your own path in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. Because people love predictability. They want things to remain the same. So when you come to the market with something that looks different, people don't know which box to fit you in. So from, for example, feeling like, what type of business are you? Am I energy environment, natural resource, or am I infrastructure? Like what, am, <laughs> what business am I actually? Oh, yeah. To um, doing something where people are like, oh, that's NGO work. Mm -hmm. And then, or that's government's work. And like to telling, oh, I, I, I work on water. And like, what's your water brand name? It's like, it's a Numa. Oh, I haven't seen that in shops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, we're selling water microgrids. It's different. So yeah. it's kind of like trying to forge your own path where you're trying to convince private sector, yes, there's mm -hmm. money to be made in water, and it's not a role of NGOs or government, okay. yes. to even trying to convince government and local NGOs that this work should be done by us. Because you find that all our water infrastructure is constructed by outsiders. It's always outsourced. Um, and like trying to show we have quality in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And so th gaining that trust is so hard. And I have to, my first three years of business, my pitch was always, oh yeah, I graduated in mechanical engineering in the US. That That's what got us pitch. clients. <laughs> wow. It's like, I would say other things, like, you know, what makes the company great, what we've already mm -hmm. done, mm -hmm. but what usually sold there is that, no, I am an engineer, but my education was not in Rwanda, it was somewhere foreign. So like having to do this, like, okay, I do want clients, but it was always something deep mm -hmm. down, like why do I have mm -hmm. to be more? Why can't I just be a Rwandan doing this? Mm -hmm. Why do I have to be engineer US educated for mm -hmm. people to trust that? Because you can come to the field and see us do it. But people have so many questions. And like I've went to service clients who have done surveys done by like, Firms they hired from South Africa or Uganda, they come, they charge a survey, we charge for like $500, they pay like 10000 20000 30000 wow. oh, yeah. And then you look at it and they miss out on the simple details mm. and you cannot trust that whole survey mm. because they don't know the environment. Of like course. the nature of surveying, we know better locally. Mm -hmm. But so from things like that to where it's like, okay, you're willing to pay them that, but you want me to do it for free because I need to prove myself. Mm. And mm. it's like, so that kind of like when you're trying to forge your own path, do something in a sector that is unexpected or people don't expect you to do that, it can be frustrating. It's a constant battle. Mm. So it doesn't feel like you just have to focus on your business, on your service delivery. There's also a whole ongoing campaign to change perceptions, mm. to be like, actually, I'm doing this. I can do this. Like, and like, is, we've now been five years. Do I really need to still prove myself more than the foreign firms. Can you change policy to favor me? Because this is my country. I'm doing what's good for my people. No, yeah. Yeah. But so it's an ongoing battle. And I think the others will relate as well. But we, it, it's so frustrating and a big challenge still to many Rwandan businesses, especially for young people, mm -hmm. that we still have to work a hundred times better just mm -hmm. to deserve the respect of our fellow countrymen, not just the clients, but like government procurement officers, uh, people like, like that who, are, who should actually have the money to help us go forward. Mm -hmm. um, but there is still reservations. You mm -hmm. have to be, prove yourself better. Due diligence happens only on local farms. They don't go verify the equipment of the other farms. Mm -hmm. And then the other farms can claim any picture they found on the internet. They get wow. the job, they come to run it, they hire you to do the work. 
because they visited you, <laughs> they didn't visit them. So there is all these little things where it's but, like... But just very quickly, th that's terrible. I, and it's a, it's a very it's common a thing, not only yeah. In, yeah. in your service, in, in many services. Yeah. We don't trust um, our product, which is terrible. And we've discussed it uh, mm -hmm. a couple of times on the square. Is that changing, do you think? I think, honestly, I will complain about this in Rwanda, but I visit Africa a lot. And I actually feel Rwanda is doing better. Because <laughs> at least here, like when you go to a supermarket, all the coffee brands, mm. most likely, like they're all Rwandan. Mm. But you go to like Kenya, which produces coffee as well. Or, you know, our neighboring countries go to West Africa, it's a whole other story. I mean, they don't even <laughs> buy local milk. But, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, you yeah. at least I think in Rwanda, we're starting to be more sensitized on like made in Rwanda in terms yes. of service delivery, in terms of products. We still have some ways to go. Mm -hmm. But I think we're on the positive trend, at least in Rwanda, mm -hmm. because when you go to the rest of Africa, it's even worse. Like they're completely consuming uh, foreign products and mm -hmm. foreign services. Um, so I think there is some changes, but it calls on everybody mm -hmm. to, there is something that should be in our hearts to be like, if this kid who's Rwandan is claiming they're doing this, mm -hmm. let me give them the benefit of the doubt. Yes, let me go check chance. it out. Mm -hmm. Not just sit in an office and be like, Eh, you know, even with mm. you know, like <laughs> local is because if we're thinking like that ourselves, you know, that's why we always hire outside consultants mm. to come and fix local issues. Mm. So like um I think it needs to change and mm. it's it's gonna change one person by one person. Mm. Uh, but for me I will say, for example, working in Yarugenge district, you know, I went worked with the mayors and the different executive secretaries and seeing a local solution, they jumped on it. Mm. And like we've had a pretty good working relationship, but there's another district that I won't name because <laughs> have they resigned? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. No, I, I hope so. so I'm yeah. gonna recheck the list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when we started, it's like they were like, no, because we were like, we have our own funding. We just need a site to provide mm -hmm. water for. Oh, yeah. And they're like, no, we're like, uh, we're still sourcing money like $200,000 to go do our own study, which we've hired this foreign firm to come and do. Mm. It's like, look guys, we're not talking about studies. We have our own mm. money. We have the tech, like give us a site and we're gonna give water. In one month, people can be fetching water. So to have somebody just being blocked, like, oh, what's your capacity to do this? Like, this is the pilot. Like, let us prove it. Yeah, prove You're not concept. losing any yes, money. Yes. You know, let mm. us try it and we'll sign an MOU. You can supervise us, have your technicians, all of that. No. But even with that, they were giving us so many hardships. We tried to work with them six months. Uh, no movement. We come to Nyaru Jenje. Two days later, they've signed an MOU with us. And now we have 12 systems in Yarugini that operate perfectly, and we've expanded to different districts. I really, I really hope policy uh, we makers or government leaders are listening. Discussion. <laughs> 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 have to <give> some <laughs> I, I can't believe we are almost running out of time. But yeah. uh, Kevin, please tell us about um, your incredible journey, last five years, a particular challenge that you had. Um, you know, like the rest have just shared with us, and how you overcame it. I, I will be very short. I think one of the biggest challenges that not only my company faces is, is uh, skilled labour. Mm -hmm. That, that was from the beginning when we went to people who were repairing, repairing shoes on the streets would be like, we cannot make shoes actually, or they were unfunctional shoes that we would make. So we had to solve it by ourselves, which, which can be very difficult for, mm -hmm. us, for a small company mm -hmm. to be educating people how to do your job and to be able to sell the product. So right now, we decided to have two products at the same time, educating people and selling the product at the same time. And after you're educated, you probably join our team and then we realize it's a big problem. So we're training more people than we even need. Mm. So um, I think many companies can relate to, to not having educated or skilled labor. Mm. And um, is, yeah, that's a Brenna, common challenge. I, I just wanted to um, shift the discussion a bit in terms of, uh, you asked the question around the impact of, of the work that you do. Um, and for me, how I define that is the true value of, you know, of your company. And the true value of your company is you know, the people you employ, um, the payment you make in terms of taxes, um, how sustainable is your business in terms of protecting the environment. So if you could very briefly, what are some of these values, you know, that, that you have, you know, across, across sustainability, respons being responsible businesses, mm -hmm. that's m meaning paying your taxes and also the well-being of people. What are some of those values? You just named them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, in terms of, are you, are you doing, what are you doing? Like, yeah. 
Uh, definitely internally we have uh, some of our values are uh, responsibility or accountability uh, and some of our outside values or, or brand values could be sustainability we're sustainable we produce sustainable products but not only that in terms of creating uh, um, jobs we do not just give you technical skills we also give you soft skills to help you run the industry in cases there is not running it's because mm -hmm. if we what if we're no longer doing it who's going to take over and make sure that things are still moving make sure that people are still being employed at the same mm -hmm. pace that we were doing it. Uh, we're not planning to stop, but we need to create an industry. We, we need to realize that it's a, it's a, it's like a, a, a blank paper mm -hmm. right now. All, most of the businesses are so blank, and we need to create more and more branches mm -hmm. to make sure that it's, it stays mm -hmm. sustainable. I just, just very quickly, f uh, unfortunately, I think we need part two and three of this, <laughs> you guys. But I have to regulate us, and I wanted us to just go on a social mm -hmm. media feed, uh, but we can come up to a conversation if time allows. And uh, just very quickly, um, our first tweet is from someone who's talking about what we spoke earlier about, about um, a business plan. And this person says that um, you need to work uh, with market assumptions and also know that a business plan is a living document. Uh, if I could ask our technical team to show the tweet in, in particular, uh, this tweet is from Richard Nivenshuti. Yes, um, this is from him. And uh, he's talking about the, 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 the nature of a business plan being an evolving uh, document. Before we go to our next tweet, uh, Brenda, mm -hmm. would you like to end on that? Yeah, I think that businesses still need a business plan. Um, because uh, it's a, again a guiding document and, and working on it, the whole point is to help you articulate your vision, have a plan, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't stop you from adjusting the numbers, mm. you know, yeah, mm. but I think it's, it's crucial. So, so uh, Mugabe, are you of the opinion, Andrew, mm -hmm. that you're, you're now, I hope you'll review your business plan? <laughs> I think I will, or yes. we'll just have to write another one, because... Yes. Yeah. It's I think totally I off of what we, we planned. Yeah. yeah. yeah doesn't uh, fit. Our next tweet is from Richard. Uh, Richard, this tweet uh, is addressed to Andrew. He says, this is inspiring stuff. My question is for Andrew. How do you convince farmers to buy disease-free cuttings of cassava, something that is alien in Rwanda? Is that something you work with? Um, we don't exactly work with cassava, but mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything I can say about that. Mm -hmm. Because if it's disease-free, how sure are you that it's, it's disease-free? Has it been certified? Yes. Like, like maybe the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture? Mm -hmm. I think the Ministry of, of Agriculture is working in the best interest of, of the farmers because if they lose, everyone loses, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we just have to go with it. Mm. What the Ministry thinks is good for the people. Yes. Yeah. And um, our next tweet is from Richard again. And uh, he's complimenting the, <laughs> the ladies, uh, the women entrepreneurs on this panel. And Richard says that, very happy about Cristela and Uzuri's success stories. They both represent what is possible once you pursue your dream. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, absolutely. And uh, not just uh, beyond that. I mean, this is, this is Rwanda. This mm. is the Rwanda that we know. This oh. is the Rwanda that we, we are getting used to, you know, young people being in charge. Uh, there are many people who have a different feel, but I mean, to see young people who are actually going out and doing the heavy lifting, I think it's good. And hopefully more young people will be encouraged mm -hmm. and inspired to you know, do the kind of work, do that, work you're that you're doing. doing. Yeah. I would like us to just, if you could give your closing remarks, um, you know, what message do you want to put out there? You know, you, you're entrepreneurs, I think you're, all, you're, on this, you're in this for the long haul. Um, you've done, you know, most of your over five years, you're starting out um, mm -hmm. and you know, usually they say, you, you, over 50% of businesses fail after, uh, before their uh, oh, yeah. first birthday. Yeah. I think you've passed the one year mark. Um, so yeah. what sort of message <laughs> happy birthday. would you, happy birthday. <laughs> thank you, thank you. What sort of message, just briefly, uh, closing remarks, do you have for um, us, um, our viewers? In just a few words. Very few words. Um, upcoming entrepreneurs, one thing I can say is, not all ideas are worth your time. Some ideas are dumb, even though they look like, <laughs> like they, are, they are good, like they're gonna have yes. a lot of impact, but and an idea could hold you uh, like hostage for, I don't know, a couple of years you're trying to do the same thing, but mm. you need to know when to cut your losses and maybe mm. find something else. That is so true. Yeah. yeah. If you can do that, find a good partner. A partnership will either put you in the sunken place or will. <laughs> Tell you what to get out, but uh, <laughs> yes, no, you're right about partnerships for sure, for sure. Get exactly. the right partnerships, and, yeah, uh, the right partnerships. partners. Maybe the last thing is uh, 
your money. The way you spend your money is going gonna, is gonna to determine mm -hmm. if you're going to move forward mm -hmm. or you're going to get another loan mm -hmm. to pay off the other loan that you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so good finance management, that's everything. Yeah. Thank you very much. Kevin, briefly. Uh, I would say that young people or ourselves, we need to start now and make sure that we make it happen now, now, now. We cannot <laughs> wait. And one other thing that I would really tell young people is that I did not start with money. I, we just started with a table. My colleague and I was sitting here, I was sitting here. So uh, a friend of mine told us that uh, if you start with a loan of $10,000, you you're literally starting with minus $10,000. But okay. if you start yeah. with zero, you're above the line of minus. Yeah. So start with zero. That's, oh, that's nice so one, yeah. smart. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, you have your factory in Gahanga, but you also have in very high end, um, Kigali Heights, um, very high end real estate, you have two stores uh, right there. How, just very briefly, how did that work? It's based on this financial management that you're Honestly, talking about. Honestly, we, ne we never had a loan. We never did anything like that. We actually waited until investors came in, you know, until people actually wanted to fund our business. And mm -hmm. We actually sold the products from uh, one pair to 20 to thousands of them. And then we're able to reinvest in our businesses and, and oh, yeah. creating more spaces where people can find our products. Because we used to sell door to door. We just take a motor, run real quick, and just go to your house and be like, oh, do you like this? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will be like, no. And you go back, you create another one, you come back, yeah. you give them the, the product, and they give you a chance until you prove them that you can actually uh, be worth spending money on. That is fantastic. No loan and <laughs> incredible financial uh, management. Yeah. Yes, very briefly, your closing yeah, remarks. I will echo a little bit what Kevin said, uh, but same here, like we've never taken a loan and I think that's one of the biggest factors uh, that kill young businesses in Rwanda. Yeah. You know, the loan market, like the interests are huge. You're never going to be able to turn that kind of profit in your first years. But um, one thing to encourage young entrepreneurs or people thinking to become entrepreneurs is there is no better time to start than today. Right now, there's so many programs looking at young entrepreneurs. They want Africans to be entrepreneurial, especially Rwanda. And as a country, we don't have a history of being traders. So I think being drawn to business is not natural for everybody. But if you're thinking to go into businesses, there's no better time to fail than now when you don't have a yeah, family, absolutely. you know, you're under 30. Yeah. Like, if you fail now, you can say, well, I was young, I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> actually, yeah, but said, can I cut you off a little bit? When I say zero, you actually, you don't really have zero, you have your energy. That's yes, capital as well. Absolutely. So sweat is huge capital. <laughs> yes. I like and like, that. I always, yeah, that's kind of the thing. Like, you ask people, like, I, I talk to young people a lot. You ask them, like, oh, why haven't you started your business yet? Mm. It's like, I'm waiting for capital. That is never really the reason. There yeah. is something else you could be yeah. doing to yeah. raise that capital or, you know, focus on your clients. Go out. If you have a client, you have a business. But if Absolutely. you try to start a business and you don't have clients, that, that's probably going to fail. Yeah. Um, and within the environment we're in, there is so many competition. There is this uh, Tony Elmelo, there is BDF, Youth mm -hmm. Connect. There is a big supporting ecosystem. Um, and some of that money can be easy to get mm -hmm. uh, before you find clients. Mm -hmm. And then you're surprised when you meet your client, which mm -hmm. clients can completely change what your mm -hmm. original focus was. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm want to encourage people to come try and fail. Uh, there is definitely some yeah. level of failing money available on the market. So mm -hmm. like take advantage of these grants, mm -hmm. uh, these opportunities for you to go out, venture, see if you can make it or fail. It's okay. There is no better time to fail than today. Mm -hmm. um, later, it's going to be too in hard. Your 20s, like yes. in your 20s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even me, I always, you know, I, when I took the risk on the business, I was like, you know what? If in two years, three years, it's not working, <laughs> you go I can call business. that a mistake. Yeah, yeah. and then yeah. I go back and to my space work. journey. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brenda. Yes. Uh, very briefly, briefly, I think the, the, the panel actually shows us that it is possible to do business without a good father because, you know, there's this big myth around, you know, if you're a young person and running a business, usually the, the next question is, who's the godfather? Who's the actual investor? So it's yeah. quite impressive, you know, to see young people that actually are running these businesses and their, their own ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that. Um, you do not need capital as a starting point to yeah. for, for any business. Thank you very much, Brenna, as always, uh, President Panelist. Uh, to our guests, Christelle, thank you very much. Kevin and uh, Andrew, it's been great to have you here. I think we should be doing this at least once a month. Once a month. <laughs> yeah. Just having young entrepreneurs like yourself just come in and show um, you know, the great stuff that you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very inspiring, uh, not only to 
upcoming entrepreneurs or current entre entrepreneurs, but also policymakers. Um, some of the things you said are very interesting um, that our leaders should you know, be listening to. So thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank our partners, Uzi Collections and Warburn Coffee. And to our viewers, thank you for watching. Keep the conversation going using the hashtag, that's the square Rwanda, uh, the square RW right in front of your screens. And see you again next week. Have a good night.